So, here we are. Seven Sundays away from Christmas. And one of those Sundays is taken up with the gift to Jesus, to which I want first to first read this morning. If you're planning on doing something in the gift to Jesus, then now is the time to start to practice and get it ready. Our slim are uh, right on top of it. We've actually talked about it once. That's as far as that got. So, we're moving right along in our usual way, and we will have something. Any of you men who are interested in participating in the gift of Jesus, please uh, let me know when, so that when we write the play or whatever it is we do this year, that we know how many parts we need. So seven weeks. There's so much to do, so many things to plan, shopping, wrapping, people to visit and so many orders to prepare for. Yet in all of this, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to take time to reflect what does Christmas mean? If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is a very simple little thing. Uh, we're just going to read A, and that's it, okay? Chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given. This is a, a, a double sentence of which we need to understand. We need to understand exactly what is going on here. A child is born, a child is given. He is born, Jesus is born of the uh, human nature, begot by the Holy Spirit. He's the Son of Man, the Son of God. If you want to see what the Son of Man is about, then you read the Gospel of Luke. If you want to have an understanding of the Son of God, then you read the Gospel of John. Both of them bring out those ideas. So here we have the spirit of Christmas, the very first Christmas. Now I want you to think about this. What was the spirit of the very first Christmas? It was one of giving and receiving. For unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. We are to receive those things which have been given to us. So a child that was born represents Jesus Christ in the fleshly nature, the human nature. A child that was given is the gift of God. So first what we're going to do, we're going to look at a child that is born in, in the human nature, begotten of the Holy Spirit. Let us look at this idea. Why was it important for Jesus to come in the flesh? Being God, could he just not say, you know what, enough is enough, there's not going to be any more sin, and, and wipe out all of the sin and give us all a fresh start? Yes, he could. He's God. God could have done that. But why did he choose the way of which he chose? Being God, he could have remodeled our abilities to love him. He could have changed us so that we no longer have sin in us. But the problem with all of this is, is that it boils down to choice. For love and with love, there is always a choice. We can choose to love or we can choose not to love. This is what God wanted. God wanted us to choose to love Him. So consequently, He loved us first. Jesus woos us by the power of His Holy Spirit, and not just the Church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit works upon the hearts of all men and all women and all children worldwide, calling them, calling them, exposing Himself to them, and showing His great love to them. The Christmas story as we know it, as it's perpetrated in our society, causes us a bit of a problem because we never seem at Christmas time to get past the baby in the manger. The world doesn't understand what this baby represents. It's just something of which we celebrate. They don't understand that this is the one 
born of flesh and the one of which was given to us. Jesus came to lift us up out of our sin, above a sin-filled world. When our parents fell in the garden, they opened a way for sin and evil in this world. Our relationship with God now has a wedge driven between us and Him in this world. A wedge was driven. When Adam and Eve sinned, a wedge was driven between God and man. A separation. Now, how does this work? When Adam and Eve sinned, you and I received the ability to sin. I, I, I know that there are people who teach that we are born in sin, but I don't believe that. I believe that we're born with the ability to sin. And I believe that that thing of which is in our flesh of which will cause us to sin is a strong and powerful enemy. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no hope. We have no choice. We will sin. That's a way of life. As Christians, we still sin. But we understand the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ in all of our life. Our relationship with God, separated. In order for this to be removed, Jesus had to be born of the flesh, for it was flesh that fell, so it was through flesh of which we had to be redeemed. Adam and Eve in the flesh sinned. In order for us to be redeemed, it had, we had to be redeemed through the flesh again. So once more, we see the idea of unto us a child is born, a child of the flesh. Jesus as a man. So why did Jesus not just simply come as an adult in the flesh and redeem us? It's God. He could have done that. Why a baby? Well, why did Jesus have to come as a baby? If you'll turn with me, please, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Jesus gives us the answer about this and concerning these things. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now from chapter, verse 3 of this chapter on to verse 16, it's all about Jesus being the good shepherd. He tells us how we know his voice and how we follow him. He tells us he is not the hired man, but rather the one who owns the sheep and who will lay down his life for them. This, this particular verse of where it says that Jesus is not the hired man, I always get this picture in my mind. Years ago when I was a young man, or maybe, well, a teenager, there was a, a, a girl that I knew who had a bunch of sheep. Now, she was a young woman, okay? She didn't, and so anyways, she hired this guy to take care of these sheep. And I always get this picture of the hired man. This guy was not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? And there were a lot of coyotes in the area, so they gave him a gun. And I don't know why they did that, but they did. Anyways, one day I was over there, and her father and I were watching out, and we could see all the sheep, and we could see the guy who was supposed to be taking care of them. And he's walking across the field like this, and he's, dragging, he's holding on to the barrel of the gun, and he's dragging it, and the butt's bouncing through the ground, and he's kind of looking around at the sheep. And every time I see the idea of a hired man, taking care of the sheep. I get this picture in my mind once more. Here's a man who really doesn't care about the sheep. He's in it for one purpose and one purpose only, for himself, right? But Jesus says, no, no. I am in this to lay down my life for you. So let's look at verses 1 and 2, because you know what? Verses 1 and 2 
are a lead up to an understanding of what takes place from 3 to 16, or 3 to 12, which is 16, 12. I don't know, a lot of 16. Okay. He tells us here that the one who enters the sheepfold, okay, in verses 1 and 2, he who did it, to, uh, the one who enters by the door, verse 2, is the shepherd. Okay? The one who enters the sheepfold by climbing over top of the sheepfold is the thief, or the enemy, if you want. Now, he says, look at this, He's, he really is pressing home this idea. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter into the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. He's really stressing the point that the idea of a thief, the one who is climbing in over the sheepfold, is not somebody who is a thief by opportunity. We have people who are thieves by opportunity. They see something, they look around, they'll take it. A thief or a robber is somebody, this is his nature. He plans these things. He plans how he's going to steal and rob. He's not just somebody who is an opportunist. He is a thief and a robber. And so Jesus uses these double words so that we understand this is not just somebody who is part-time. This is a full-time occupation with him. A thief and a robber. <laughs> Excuse me. So if Jesus is the shepherd who enters legally, then Satan must be the robber who climbed into the sheepfold. The thief and the robber. 10-10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we get this idea that this, this thief and robber is the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I, I, I want you to see, now when they start with the idea of kills, we, we get an idea in our head and it's hard to shake. You always think of the idea of kills as being murdered. Or something losing its life. But why does it have to be that way if we just think about it? Satan comes not so much to kill the flesh. He comes rather to kill the ideas of God in our life. He comes to destroy those things of which are of God that are in our life. He kills them. He cuts them off. He separates us from them. It can be in the sense of, of somebody who's been hurt in a church if you want and, and refuses to go back to any church. To a large degree, Satan has managed to kill part of their faith because he separates them from the body of Christ, which is the church of Jesus Christ. I know that things happen in the church that cause people grief, but you know what? There's a lot more stuff happens in our life when we are separated. Which is easier as an enemy to pick off? One guy by himself or a group? And so consequently, those who, who feel that they can do this Christian walk all by themselves in a lone range of Christian type of thing is missing out on the blessings of God of which are arrived in the body of Christ. The other thing of which I find when we get away from the church and we get away from someplace uh, on our own if you want, we start to get funny ideas. We read scripture and we apply it in ways of which it was never meant to be applied. And there's nobody there to say you're doing it wrong. That happens in the body. That should happen to all of us, myself included. So he kills. He can kill us, the, our faith. He can kill our ideas. He can kill our love for God. All of those things. Kills. Steals. What does he steal? He steals the word of God from us. He steals those things of, of which would draw us closer. A little word of discouragement here, a little word of this and that, and it isn't very long that he's got us extremely discouraged and he's managed to kill part of our walk before God. And thus he destroys. 
the Church of Jesus Christ with just a little bit of doubt and a little bit of pride, he can pull us apart completely. So here he is, he's Satan, he's the one who climbs in over the fence. When did he climb in over the fence? When he took illegal entry into the world and he came before Adam and Eve and he tempted them. He was allowed into the world but he was not part of this creation. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's two different things. Satan was not part of the creation of the world so he has no legal part in this world. But now, how about the one who enters by the door? Unto us a child is born. Jesus has legal entry because how did he enter the world? Through a woman. The same as each and every one of us. He's part of the creation of this world in his flesh. At the very beginning of Genesis, in the second chapter, it tells us, speaking of Jesus and the, and the enemy, it tells us that he who is born of a woman would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would strike his heel. So we understand that the one who is legally in this world is Jesus. He has legal entry because he was born the same as you and I. If he had to come just as a man of his own creation, that would not have been legal entry. He had to come as a child as a baby, to fulfill those things of righteousness and legality. Remember, God is a judge, and as such, there are certain things that have to be done by Him and Jesus to fulfill our redemption, and they have to cover the law and cover grace. It's strict ground they were walking on. So we see that Satan entered this world illegally having climbed over the fence and the sheepfold of which is called the world, once he's there, he tries to destroy the sheep who are us. See the world itself, oh Satan does works within them, but one of the greatest works that I think that Satan does within the church of Jesus Christ is bringing discouragement bringing little things that spoil things. The things that we allow to come between us and God that really, really, when push comes to shove, does not matter. So, Satan climbed over the fence and Jesus entered legally. And thus Jesus was able, because of his legal entry into the world, we have unto us a son is born. A son of what? A son of this world. One who was like us. It says that Jesus was of the same nature as what we are and was tried in like ways in which we are and that all of the things of which we are tempted with, Jesus was tempted with. Don't buy into the idea that Jesus only had three temptations and they took place in the wilderness. That can't be true. If he was tried and tempted in like fashion of which I was, then he had to have been tempted to do a lot of other things besides that. What are some of the things that tempt us day after day? And, and you know what, Satan does strange things sometimes and even tempts us in areas of where we really don't need to be tempted because we don't have any problems with it. I remember a few years ago that I was driving out of, uh, at that time I on 52nd and Memorial, it was Revelstoke Plumber, and I was driving out of there. And I see this guy, he's a big guy, and he's got this guy hoisted up off the ground and against the fence, and he's holding him like this, and I'm driving out, and I'm thinking, oh Lord, I really don't need this right now. You know, but you don't want to see some guy getting beat up. So I stop my man, I get out, and this guy holds him up with one hand, I'm not kidding, gets out of his wallet and clips a badge and said, I was in the bank and he just robbed the bank. He said, can you phone for backup? And he said, and he had a bag of money and he threw it over there somewhere. Well, I went over there somewhere. 
And there's a little wind blowing, and whether I wear like $20 bills and $100 bills floating around in the wind, I'm gathering them up. I thought I was on some kind of a game show. I'm <laughs> sticking them in this guy's bag, okay? And I got a handful of money. Hundreds and twenties and fifties and all kinds of things. If I ever heard the voice of Satan, I heard that day, he said, put something in your pocket, we'll never know. Wouldn't that be simple? Test it, try it. I've never had a problem with the idea of, uh, uh, of stealing. I never, I'm not saying I never stole anything in my life. I'm just saying I was not, I didn't lean that way. Other things, yes, but not that. What a funny thing to tempt me with, especially as a Christian. But you know what? How easy would it have been? And thus Satan works in our lives even in areas of where we don't expect him to work. So now, as on to us, a son is given, a child is given. We all know this scripture by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. A child is given. God gave his son. John chapter 10, verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, for there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus was preaching to the Jewish people at this time, and so who's the other sheepfold? Us were brought, so that there is now what? One flock, one shepherd, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Unto us a child is given. Verses 17 and 18 tells us of why Jesus was able to do this. For this reason the Father loves me. Now listen to why God loves Jesus. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This child, unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. What is Christmas all about? It is about the legal entry of Jesus Christ into this world so that he can do his work of redemption. The Christmas story is not about Mary and Joseph and a baby in the manger. Not when it comes right down to where the rubber meets the road. The Christmas story is about the legal entry of Jesus Christ into this world so that he can redeem us. And the, the best part of all of this is, is that in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us that at just the right time God sent his son into the world to redeem us. At just the right moment. Everything laid out. Everything perfect. This is the Christmas story. It's about the love of God laying in a manger. I, I, you know what? Rather than just seeing a baby in the manger, when we look into that, that manger, what should we see? We should see the love of God for each and every one of us. The redemption of mankind, the fullness of God laying in a little baby. And the very essence of it should show beyond the love of the baby, it should show I love you so much that I have come to give my life and to glorify the Father through that. No man will take it from me. I lay it down on my own. Why? Because he loves us. This is about the Son of God taking our place and paying the price for our sins. Jesus represents each and every one of us in the fullness of who he is. As a man, he was sinless. As the Son of God, he was already sinless, totally, but with the idea of him being sinless is in the fact that in the flesh, he had nothing, Satan had nothing on him. Nothing, he tells us. He represented us, and so then when he died on that cross, 
As Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, so Jesus Christ brought salvation and redemption into the world because he was the second Adam. And as such, we can walk in the fullness of the flesh of Jesus Christ. We can walk without sin. Now, how do we do that? We do that by through our repentance and the understanding that God sees us as totally without sin because we are the children of Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given. Because this son was given to us, then the Holy Spirit was sent to do what? Recreate us in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So again, unto the world another son is given. The church of Jesus Christ. We walk in the fullness of His Holy Spirit, ministering the same as what Jesus did. Because we have received the same Spirit that Jesus received, which allows us to cry, what? Have a Father, a Spirit of adoption. This is what Christmas is about. This is the work that which was done. Unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. This is the Christmas story. Verse, starting in the 13th verse, and suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. With those with whom he is pleased. How do we please God? Well, we can't please him by what we do or what we say. We please him through Jesus Christ. We please him in the fact that we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We please him by the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and leads us and guides us. We please him by doing those things of which he wants us to do. That's the same way that Jesus did it. That's the same way we'll do it because the same Spirit that dwelt in Christ dwells in us. For to us a child was born, a child given. It was for us that Jesus came. This is just, as I said, just not the story of a baby or shepherds or angels. It's not about Mary or Joseph. It's about a God of love who came for us. A God of love, a God of mercy who came just for us. Each and every one of us. He was a man just like any one of us, and yet the Son of God. And because, as I already said, because Jesus was the Son of God, we too can become the sons of God. Because Jesus was. So we have the, the earthly part of which was legal and the sacrifice of which was made through that, and we have the heavenly part of Jesus which enables us to become as he was and be also sons of God. What do the things of this world matter if I love Jesus? What do they matter? If you can say Jesus is mine and I am Jesus, then lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice aloud. You saints of God, rejoice. This is a time of celebration. This is the, the, the greatest holiday that the world has, Christmas. It's the very last holiday of which was added on to the church. It's now the most popular because all of the world celebrates it, not knowing why, but they do. It's a great time of, of spirit of giving and, and those kinds of things. But for us as Christians, to sit and reflect on a baby in a manger and to say unto us, unto me, a child was born, one who was legal, unto me, a child was given to have me, give me life and life eternal. Mm -hmm. This is the celebration of Christmas. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning, Father God, that indeed unto us, unto us, Lord. You gave your love, 
your joy and your peace. You showed us exactly what you like, O Lord, in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look upon the love of Jesus, we look upon the glory of Jesus, we look along upon the peace of Jesus, as we look upon all of the attributes of Jesus, then we know, God, that that is what you are like. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, joined together in one communion and with one love for each and every one of us. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name.